what's going on YouTube what's happening homies you already know what it is welcome to or welcome back to Kovacs Corner I appreciate you taking the time come through check out another react video we are going to be reacting to Garrett Sai Shire he's a pillar in the Yu-Gi-Oh community check his channel out make sure check it out I've been following him for a hot minute too he has a bunch of Yu-Gi-Oh videos awesome awesome videos check them out and also feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms down in the description below become a member if you'd like to you get access to a video a day in advance and uh yeah we're pretty much going to get back get into it the history of Yu-Gi-Oh beef so i've already seen this one time it's it's pretty jokes man i ain't even gonna lie the way how people end up beefing off in fucking Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> your deck ain't as good as my deck I can take you anytime. It's hilarious. YCS and shit like that. It's jokes. But anyway, uh, video link and also the creator's homepage is going to be down in the description as well. Make sure you check them out. Drop a like, sub. If you enjoy the video, drop a like and sub. And yeah, we are about to get into it. Boom. The day is April 15th, 2012. And this guy, Nazar Sarhan, has just been challenged to a duel. A few months this is actually pretty dope this whole storyline right here is actually really really dope moments prior he had just been crowned a two-time ycs champion two times ycs dallas 2011 and now the second edition of the tournament in 2012. he literally has the trophy next to him on the table this is yeah man it's pretty crazy the duel that he ends up encountering the duelist he encounters i should say and the duel that they have is pretty intense it's crazy as a kicker, he had just completed the perfect YCS, an absolute rarity in Yu-Gi-Oh. 16 wins and zero losses. 16 and 0. Who is stupid enough to challenge this guy? A real life shadow Blake, game. The Lotus McCrary is apparently. He just Lotus. Lotus is a G in the Yu-Gi-Oh community as well for like YCSs and locals in his area. Just got his first top cut appearance at this very tournament in Dallas. However, prior to this tournament, the Lotus is what many top players would call a scrub of a rando. In fact, <laughs> two weeks ago, Blake had no idea what Nazar Sarhan, the YCS champion, even looked like. I. I've, I've obviously been running Samurai since they first come out, and uh... Six Samurai, man. Six Samurai is one of the dopest decks that you can use in Yu-Gi-Oh. In my opinion, from 2012 and on, there's been upgrades to it. But yeah, when awesome deck. When was happened for the first time, um, I thought, I was like, man, I'm about to take this, and I'm about to get my name on the map. I wanted to be known as, like, the best Samurai player in the United States. That was my goal. I fell short. I was salty about it. I heard this guy named Nazar won. I didn't know who he was, but I mean, it didn't really matter to me. I was like, man, good for him, he won. Coming in this year at Cali, I hear a little bit talk about Nazaro. He might take uh, Long Beach. I get to Cali, it's Friday night, we're all testing in um, the, I forget, I think it's the Sheraton, or whatever hotel it was at. Um, and I'm with my friend looking for somebody to play with, and they're like, oh, there's a guy looking at me like, like malice intent. I'm like, who is this guy looking at me like, the DJ? And um, he's like, oh, that's just Nazar. He looks at everybody like that. And so I'm thinking, like, it's more of a, hey, uh, you look like a decent duelist. Let, uh, let's play, like, some Yu-Gi-Oh type stuff, right? I go over and ask him, hey, Nazar, you want to play? And then, like, he gives me kind of this smug look, and um, he kind of blows me up. And so I'm like, all right, I guess you don't want to play, so I'll leave. <laughs> like, homie, I just went back to back. I don't need to talk to you. You were scrubbed to me. It's like, all right, man, I guess you suck. <laughs> the next two days, it was kind of like um, this quiet storm between us. Every time he would pass by, there was like, bluntly, he was an asshole. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I don't, I don't want any problems with this dude. So um, I left it alone. This is how Nazar sees Blake. It's a waste of time. No notability. If he doesn't know who I am, why do I care? And that's funny, too, because it's more so like a respect thing. It's like the way how Birdman went up to Hot 97 being like, put some respect on my name. <laughs> and hey, maybe the duel really was a waste of his time. I mean, Brian just did the equivalent of challenging Kyrie Irving to a game of pickups. The incident at the Sheraton was one thing you could put down and forget. 
but Brian thinks he deserves a game versus Nizar. Now we get to uh, two weeks later in Dallas, and um, this is obviously the same Nizar that won Dallas um, last year. My friends are like, hey, Blake, you got to, like, this is your chance. So, like, you're, you're running Sam's, obviously, you got something to protect, so you need to show the world why you're a good Sam player. And I'm like, all right. And my goal at the end of the day, I was to get to day two. Um, but then I, I, I did that. Surprisingly, I ended up sixth place going in day two. That's but crazy, sixth place goal. still. I, like, I want to play Nazar in the finals, and I want to beat him. Like That was my goal. Not not because I was salty about him winning, but just because I felt like he was the man, and like that was the guy to beat, kind of like Billy Brake, right? So, The only way how you could judge yourself on being the best is beating the best. Afterwards, or at least event, competing with uh, him. We see Nazar um, getting his uh, profile and stuff, and he's walking around with his click. And he has his trophy in his hand, and then my friend John comes up, and he um, he asks uh, me, he's like, hey, uh, I, I'm looking for trouble. I want to play somebody for money. I want to play somebody good. So I haven't seen Nazar come by, and um, I'm like, why don't you play Nazar for money? And so he calls him out. He's like, hey, Nazar, like, you want to play for 20? Uh, why the F would you want to play me? He was like, you think you're better than me? Uh, you think you think you beat me? He's telling him to like, go away because you're not going to beat uh, a pro. Like you're, You just want the... The title, oh, you beat the the champion. And my friend John, he was about to explain himself. He was like, no, I really want to. And then in the middle of that, Nazar just like turned around real quick and then walked right. off. Like, and his friends turned around. Some Straight disrespectful, bro. That's mad disrespect. Simultaneously, like uh, some some stuff you see in the movies. I'm like, and they just walked out. They didn't say anything. He was like, I don't have time for this. And he just turned around. I'm like, more so than me. Uh, saying, hey, I want to defend John because that was obviously disrespectful. Like, I was driven because I was tired of people letting this happen. Like, his behavior is only his behavior because people constantly allow it to happen. Yeah, facts. Initially, Nazar wants to decline the duel. In fact, he has every right to. He has nothing personal with Blake McCrary. He can just say no and leave. Nazar has so much more to lose here than McCrary. If he were to just say no and leave after winning and stuff, everyone would end up calling him a pussy, you know? So it's like, yo, you got to kind of, you got to duel, bro. You got to duel. Crary. Back in 2011, Nizar at age 16 has had cheating allegations follow him throughout his career. He had cheating allegations follow him in his career as well. That's another thing too, whether or not if he were to get caught cheating. You know what I'm saying? Like, you end up getting frowned upon within the Yu-Gi-Oh community, especially in the TCG community at YCS. Bro. At YCS Dallas 2011, Nizar's first top cut appearance became his first win. People saw that he didn't take some of his wins seriously, and that he was doing some things like playing with Konami sleeves rather than the one you buy at locals. Even though you were forced to sleeve your deck in Konami sleeves when you get into top cut and like his deck list didn't make sense to the vast majority of players, even though it was really far ahead of its time, let's just call them bogus claims. So winning his second YCS was there to disprove that. But young Nizar, under the pressure where you go 16 and zero, declining is almost like losing at that point facts that's what i'm saying exclusive one play for me you don't sit you don't come to my fucking city and you don't disrespect my friends nigga. you don't do that shit if you don't want to if you don't want to play them i said now, no. if you don't want to play them you don't have to act like you don't you ain't gonna i said no said why I you but don't, it doesn't don't. matter important context so there's a card that's called gateway of the six every time a samurai monster is summoned it gains two bushido counters you can nice. pay four Bushido counters to summon back a samurai. And when you summon back Essentially a samurai the monster, its own effect, it, it gets back its two counters, you know, in this own self-perpetuating loop. This allows for a near infinite resurrecting army of samurai monsters. And it was so powerful that it got limited to one copy per deck. Blake McCrary has just unsleeved the best card in his deck. Well, this is on camera. That's crazy. Like, if you lose, huh? You don't look like a fool. It's only lost the week. Huh? Yeah, he only it's only lost the week. It would be his only time. <laughs> 16 and 0. Now it's 16 and 1. 16 and 1. Blake wins the dice roll.
The game starts off with uh, Blake drawing a seventh card for turn. Immediately after, Nazar drops the banger. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, my God. Come on, you got You only gave what you see? Blake, you know that's it's on not his He does put the card he drew, a keys on, back to the top of the deck. And then he sets five. But for years afterwards, this moment would undergo a lot of scrutiny because Blake knows he's gonna top deck a monster. Many say that's the reason he sets five cards instead of four. Since he set five, if he were to theoretically draw something like a Xi'en smoke signal or any other useful spell in his deck, he wouldn't be able to activate it. Instead, he gets to make five trap cards live and ready to go. That's crazy. Maybe it was just a mistake or a subconscious play, and it's really hard to quantify the malicious intent of the situation. Not only that, but like, as uh, as Buddy coming into it, that's the YCS champion two time, right? Buddy's here with like his friends and stuff. He like has a purpose. He has a purpose. Then you're gonna call him out on cheating allegations, where it's like. If he knew your whole history, your whole history and stuff, being like, didn't you get booked for cheating yourself? Like, what's going on here? But like, he ended up putting the card back. It doesn't really matter because he ends up having the card regardless. But who's not to say that he could have like switched cards? I understand where Nazir is coming from. Where if I was him, if I accused him of cheating, I'd be like, yo, you have to shuffle your deck again, bro. I would want a second shovel, or like to cut. But, technicalities aside, back to the grudge match. If Nazar loses, this will be his only loss of the whole weekend. I repeat, only loss of the whole weekend. So still giving him his respect, you know what I mean? They go his trophy. So, Blake proceeds to have a trap card for every single normal summon of Nazar's Dino Rabbit deck. He has Solemns, Fiendish Chain, and then lastly, as Nazar is actually able to resolve a Rescue Rabbit for two Saber Soul Eye, don't judge my English. <laughs> El Clasico. Boom. Like top decks. Needing to get in two attacks here for lethal damage, he searches Hand of the Six Samurai with Smoke Signal. Nice. And then using Six Samurai United to draw only a single card. Scoot. He scoot. Yo, the first defeat right there. Boom. <laughs> and Dino Rabbit was a classic deck back in the day. In game two, Nazar gets to start with the rabbit, getting out his Cabazoles and summoning Evil's Arlagia, a 2400 attack walking solemn judgment. You can see why this era of Yu-Gi-Oh was called Dino Rabbit. Lagia effectively skips the turn of Blake. Going back to Nazar, he doesn't commit anything more to the field, and it's right back to Blake. I guess he'll take that opportunity. Legendary Six Samurai. Shinin. Was that Warrior Type Tuner? Six Samurai Monster once per turn during the player's turn. When your opponent activates a spell trap card, you can negate the activation, and if you do destroy it, if this card would be destroyed, you can destroy another face up Six Samurai Monster you control instead. Huge. Huge. This is Blake the Lotus. I like that, Blake the Lotus. So I'm going to change the name on, on his YouTube video. I don't want to say the Lotus. The Lotus. The Lotus. Now, Blake assembles a board of legendary Six Samurai, Shien, and Naturia Beast, effectively nice. shutting down all spells and traps of Nizar. Nizar is finally able to resolve a normal summon and make Wind Up Zen Mains, a card that will buy him another turn into this field. 
Nazar lives and then resolves another tour guide to get him Levier the Sea Dragon, which summons back his banished rescue rabbit, makes Utopia, which then protects his Levier and his life points. Nizar nice. has stabilized. On the follow-up turn, Nizar regains control of the game with Utopia Ray, which then clears Shied. Lastly, Blake swings with Turia Beast. Mirror Force got used. Like Mirror Force, the whole Mirror Force set is super OP. If you're able to have the whole Mirror Force set kind of thing in your deck and just run a Mirror Force deck, that'd be dope as fuck. Game two. Game two. We've got game three, and it's Shien set three go from McCrary. We've got normal summon Grand Mole. In the battle phase, the Grand Mole is met with the Phoenix Chain, then Mystical Space Typhoon from Nazar, which baits out Shien's spell negate. In main two, Nazar nearly clears with Dark Hole, but there's a set solemn Boom. judgment. And with Damn, not judgment, but same result. Nice. No way to get rid of the Shien. Blake is in full control with the tempo. And Nazar has to find an answer, and fast. Blake is hammering away at life points. To respond, all Nazar got is a 1900 beat stick. Uh, it swings over the keys on, I guess, and he passes. Here comes another baseball bat swing with a 3000 attack Shien. Nazar even gets a chance to get in for Gore. She ends at 3k. Nice, because he has this monster attached to it. Swing with a 3000 attack Shien. Nazar even gets a chance to get in for Gore's the Emissary of Darkness. That doesn't matter. Nope. Everybody give it up for Gore's mama's ass. Everybody give it up for After a six Sam United, a samurai monster, and an asceticism. Scoop. Scooped. He scooped. Concedes. Yeah, Blake won. Blake the Lotus won. He beat the back. No matter how big of an upset you just pulled off, respect the sportsmanship at the end. This match would light up the internet. It's that's crazy. An that was an intense in match. Real life. Blake wanted a duel, and he fought back the most on-fire player in the game. Joey Wheeler just took on Merrick and won. This match would <laughs> one way of looking at it, be eh? perfect YCS to many people, and Nizar would have the cheating allegations follow him for many more years, and eventually he would just fade away from the game. But Blake had finally restored his honor. He said he would put his city on his back, and he delivered under pressure, surrounded by many of the best players in the game. However, when some people fight for their honor, other people think that someone needs to get put in their place. This is Kevin Silva. He just won- uh -huh. This is pretty dope too. This is pretty sick. Cause you get like a rookie against a pro right here too. This is, this was a pretty nutso battle. ARG St. Louis in 2014. Kevin Silva. I don't know, for Kevin, it's a pretty big achievement. Let's see what he has to say. I bet Jeff Jones is so mad that I won. Oh yeah, you too. I'll be the one to say it on here. I'll play Jeff Jones for any amount of money uh, up to 500. Any amount of money up to 500. So it's not any amount of money. You would play him 500 and under. Yeah, but I know he won't play because he's so cocky. <laughs> oh, okay. So he has just decided to play a guy named Jeff Jones. Jeff Jones seems like a very unassuming name. Let's see, uh... Until you find out who Jeff Jones is. Jeff Jones won SJC Edison in 2010, the last ever Shonen Jump Championship. There are a few alternate ways to play Yu-Gi-Oh! And in 2024, by far the most popular alternate format is called Edison Format. It's the format of the tournament that Jeff Jones won. Edison format oh, was shit. crazy. Yep, Ruxin's yep. all about that. Okay, yeah, we'll play for my 
Call that. So Tennessee beating this motherfucker's ass for five hundred dollars. You better sure you bring that shit. Like I know we all love a good story where a stupid person gets shut up. This is going to be a story where a stupid person gets shut up. Or <laughs> flies around the Yu-Gi-Oh space. The next big event, ARG Nashville, is going to be a movie. It's 500 bucks between Jeff Jones, the GOAT, and the cocky Kevin Silva. The community hears all about it. It's some kid who's about to challenge one of the faces of Yu-Gi-Oh! Mount Rushmore. However, ARG's tournament management, of course, gets wind of it. Are they going to shut it down? Is it over? Is a... As soon as they end up catching wind of it, what do they do? Authority finally gonna get in the way of some cocky kid's challenge? No! Instead, they turn it into a spectacle. But it's the ARG Nashville charity. Make match. some money off that, bro. We'll have a stream bro. and commentary <laughs> from the friends of both duelists. ARG will front the money to the winner's charity of choice. So guys, we have some awesome, pristine coverage from ARG Nashville. 2014. Let's run it. Now, Jeff is known for bringing some fun decks to events. During this format, the idea of the best deck was something along the lines of Firefist, Vermeil, and whatever was left of the Dragon Rulers. Uh, Brotherhood of the Firefist Bear, Mermail, and Blast Dragon Ruler of Infernos. Nice, they're all effect cards. 1600, 2400, 2800. Nice. So you got a Beast Warrior, Sea Serpent, and a Dragon. Fire. But for this charity match, Jeff has brought Harpies. It's not the best deck. It's Harpy not Chandler. necessarily oh. the worst, but it's brutally simple with just summon Harpies, make rank fours, and I guess set a couple trap cards. But this is just Jeff Jones style. And it's honestly a power play for Jeff. Knowing how Nizar had so much to lose back at his previous match, in this match, it makes a lot of sense to play a dumb deck. If some young underdog no-namer like Kevin Silva takes down a god of the game, it would be pretty embarrassing. But not if he's trolling the grudge match. Jeff Jones has somehow flipped the script of a grudge match before it's even begun. The B down. Whew. One and oh. One one. No effects. Two one. Jeff wins 3-1. Damn, son. Easy clap. So, what happened after? I'm gonna be honest, not much. Uh, the grudge match went about as expected. Jeff Jones would continue to be a god of the game, and even more reinforced by winning a best of five with a bad deck. The funnier part is that Kevin Silva would fall off the face of the Yu-Gi-Oh planet. He'd stop playing the highest level events and then just fade away. So, however, all the hype and excitement after Kevin Silva and Jeff Jones didn't really translate into any more of these grudge matches. So it's like after talking all that shit, you know, and then you actually go up against the person just because you lose against that person who is like technically a face on Mount Rushmore of Yu-Gi-Oh for competitions and YCSs like that. He shouldn't have disappeared into obscurity. He should have like practiced and like came back stronger than ever and kind of figured out what what homie was playing, right? Like actually watch back videos of what decks he was using, his play style and all that, and have like a redemption arc instead of like just fading out nowhere. Why? Back from 2004 to 2014, Yu-Gi-Oh! was kind of in its first decade. I sat down with Bowden Temnik, a guy who has been playing the game since he was 11 years old back in 2005, and he says that everyone was just a young, rowdy teenager. The fact of the matter is that the player base had moved into its 20s, and also newer players were just around more grown-up people. People just realized this kind of thing wasn't worth their time. Petty little arguments over who's better and who's not. You can prove that to yourself by winning tournaments and events. 
and many other pro players I've talked to agree with this sentiment. It's also generally riskier, as I alluded to, to play a single match, winner takes all the reputation style of game. We're older, and as humans, the reason we form civilization is that we said fighting is bad. Also, the internet just became like more realistic. Less often things happen in person. Having a beef is just whatever, really. Where people would just talk online back and forth a good majority of the time, like MSN Messenger days. People would just act different online and fail to bring it in person. With that being said, the date is April 21st, 2024. At a brewery in Raleigh, North Carolina, the main event after the main event is about to begin. There's a gathering around a little table. There's 40 of like Yu-Gi-Oh's best players surrounding a small bar stool. Two players have set up mats and are staring each other down. There That's are even crazy. people in the rafters getting a bird's eye view. Well, what's the hype about? On the left of this tiny little table is Hani Jaware. Hani can only be described as someone who is hyper competitive. He doesn't take BS from anybody and he will play anyone at any time. In addition, he's a three-time YCS champion, winning nice. the most difficult YCS at Pasadena 2022 with tier limits. Pass. He's one of the most established players in Yu-Gi-Oh! And let's just say he's got an ego to defend. Opposing him is an up-and-coming Yu-Gi-Oh! player named Sean Pittman. In the past year, Pittman had been grinding online Yu-Gi-Oh! And he has translated that online notoriety into winning multiple different regionals. But the... But it's like completely different from playing Yu-Gi-Oh! online to actually playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in person. Translated that online notoriety into winning multiple different regionals. But the one thing with Sean is that even though he has all of this insane regional success, he hasn't been able to convert it into a single YCS top. And so the beef begins with Sean Pittman playing an online team battle against Hani Jawari and a group of his students. And Sean's team manages to reverse sweep the team battle with a Rescue Ace deck. Ooh, Rescue Ace. At the time was considered a bad deck. The next day, Sean Pittman is in a group chat looking for some practice duels with some stakes involved, where he gets told that one of Hani's students is looking for a duel. Seeing how he played against Hani, a little bit of banter comes through. One of Hani's students, free bread. <laughs> this gets leaked to Hani. Let's get to yapping, ladies and gentlemen. Just calling him out, eh? So, it's gonna go down. Pittman versus Hani and Raleigh. One last hurrah for a Yu-Gi-Oh! grudge match. After a slew of hand traps, game one just goes to Hani. It's hard to mess up a game when you've got pocket aces. In game two, Hani's hand is simply weak. And despite his two hand traps, Pittman plays his cards correctly to win and bring out game three. In game three, Hani again starts off weak. His hand can't play through a single effect veiler reasonably, ending on IP and flambers with Sean Pittman's hand being absolutely disgusting. So Pittman goes into the battle phase and summons out Jerusalem. This will prevent IP from being able to link summon, which then stops flambers from triggering cutting off Hani from any and all plays next turn. So just cutting off the main source for him to end up summoning the monsters that he needs, eh? Jeez. However, even then, he leads off suboptimally. He banishes Hani's Diabell Star from the graveyard, which is a play that easily could have punished by a set wanted, adding the Witch back from the graveyard, which would prevent the Truest Worm from summoning. And people around the table already get to talking. Afterwards, Pittman goes into a Dark Charmer and then uses Tactics to take, stealing one of Hani's Flamberges. But critically, he does not use the effect of Hani's IP Masquerina out of his graveyard, which would have effectively locked up the match instantly, allowing him to make infinite plays out of his extra deck. He makes he- And that's the difference between playing online and playing in real life, because online, it'll usually give you a heads up about things that you're able to do with your graveyard for certain monsters that are in there with those kind of effects, right? If you're playing in real life and you're not used to it, knowing what the effects of the monsters is, even though you probably do, but like not really thinking about it at that moment in time is, is the difference. 
where if you're playing it continuously in real life, you're used to that kind of setup, right? Especially with Link Monsters. Link Monsters is nuts. Allowing him to make infinite plays out of his extra deck. He makes Hida instead, which takes the Snake Eye Ash, which walks right into Hani's Called by the Grave. Another misstep from Pittman, but this game isn't over. Pittman has one last push with his Snake Eyes Oak in his hand, which eats a Nibiru from Hani Jawari. Sean Nibs. Pittman just extends the handshake out of embarrassment. Too many mistakes in too little time. The pressure of being around all the top players in the game just got to Pittman. That's all you could really say. But the craziest part is that the game was far from over. Hani had no playable cards remaining in his hand, and his next top deck was a solemn judgment. Both players would be fighting with sticks and stones, and Hani was not out of the woods yet. In retrospect, the match itself felt extremely old school. We have a player who's grinding through Yu-Gi-Oh, trying to make a name for himself, but just hasn't gotten there yet, challenging the best in the game. It's a Nazar and a Blake McCrary, or a Silva and Jeff Jones, players who want to punch up and make a name for themselves in the community. But at the end of the day, fame doesn't really matter. I sat down with a bunch of top players and asked them the question, what does it mean to play for pride? And is it worth it? Overwhelmingly, I got the reply back. So, leave a comment down below. Is it worth playing for pride? Like, some people want to play for pride. It's understandable and stuff like that. Or, like, competition. Or just for fun. I'd rather play just for fun, not really pride. Uh, unless it's like, I were to get into a tournament, it's not really pride. It's more so just competitiveness. Right? And even then, you could lose at any time. Because anybody can lose to anybody in Yu-Gi-Oh! It simply isn't. One player said that anyone can lose in Yu-Gi-Oh! And <laughs> just because you beat someone once or twice doesn't prove anything. At the end of the day, because which is a fact, ask, what do competitive players even play Yu-Gi-Oh! for? Because they could come back with another deck or improvements to their deck and just crush you. You know what I'm saying? We don't get the scholarships, the $10,000 prize cards, or the comically large checks by playing this game. We all play it because we think it's the best card game, and we think it's the best way we can prove to ourselves that we are truly good at something. Beefs more so drag down the community rather than uplift it at the end of the day. It gives people a negative view of others. For Nazar, he thought he had beat the cheating allocations with his second YCS win but immediately after, he had the forums going for his throat again. Kevin Silva basically vanished from Yu-Gi-Oh! after losing to Jeff Jones and the- So, like, that was kind of dumb. You know what I mean? Like, he should have vanished from Yu-Gi-Oh! He should have, like, kept it up and improved and then came back, is how I feel about it. Not playing for pride, like, playing for experience and fun, right? Kevin Silva basically vanished from Yu-Gi-Oh! after losing to Jeff Jones and the year that followed. I guess he just got way too embarrassed about the situation after calling out a goat, right, and getting clapped. When you shouldn't get embarrassed about that kind of situation, especially if you're going up against a goat. Tom Pittman likely won't be the same. He's established enough, but it really hurts the character of the game. So enjoy the hype and stay at a beat. Remember, guys, we're playing a children's card game. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Shoutouts to all the professional players I had the chance to sit down and talk to. The answering of Facebook messages and all the likes. Y'all know who you are. And as always, shout out to the Patreon. Sorry for the... So shout out to all the professional players that he was able to interview and of getting some insight about the game uh, that we all love and play and enjoy with, uh, with each other and stuff. But yeah, that's a history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Beef. It was a pretty interesting video when I first seen it. And I was like, you know what? I gotta do a reaction to this because like it's too good to pass up you know what i'm saying so make sure you go check out garrett Sy shire check this video out links are going to be down in the description as always feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms think about becoming a member on youtube here you'll get access to a video a day in advance compared to everybody else where they gotta wait and hit up the discord man share memes any other videos that you want me to react to feel free hit me up but yeah no man pretty much until next time that's going to do it for us take care of yourself and each other and stay hydrated man peace i was dope as fuck though <laughs>